I know some of you are thinking that because it's me this week, you got enough time to get here in time for the Easter egg hunt. But I'm trying to keep it to around 25 to 28 minutes this week. Is there a microphone I should maybe check to make sure it's off? I'm good. All right. There we go. All right. Yeah, it's me. It's Cedric Lundy, one of the teaching pastors here at Watershed, continuing in our series, A New World, A Different World is Possible. And just in case you didn't know, today is Palm Sunday. That's right. Today is the beginning of Holy Week. And I don't know about you, but for me, Palm Sunday brings back memories of being a kid in church. And the pastor, whoever the pastor was that week, before they began their sermon, would call all the youngins, all the children, down front for the little children's Bible story. And, of course, we would all come down very eager that Sunday because we knew that as well as reading the passage about Palm Sunday, he would give us a palm read, and we would be so excited about it, and at the same time trying not to poke each other's eye out with the tip of the palm read, like those were the good old days. And alas, I'm sorry, but I am here empty-handed. I have no palm reads to pass out to the handful of people that are here, or much less those of you that are out there in Facebook Live land. But you know what? I was thinking, yeah, you guys are on Facebook, so I'm going to do this instead. There you go. There's enough palms for everybody. But yes, this week we're continuing on in talking about a different world is possible. And we're talking about, I just mentioned how it is Palm Sunday. And that's where I want to begin this morning. In John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it had been written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and he had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that? You are gaining nothing. The world has gone after him. They're saying to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. We as the Pharisees are gaining nothing. The world has gone after him. Now, if I were, say, directing a musical of Holy Week, and I wanted to find a song that set the tone for what's coming, that Jesus is in essence handing himself over to those who have been seeking to kill him for the past few months, that Jesus is about to face off with the powers of empire and all their horrific might, then I would have to go with public enemies, welcome to the terror dome. I got so much trouble on my mind, refuse to lose. Here's your ticket, hear the drummer get wicked. The crew to you to push the back to black attack, so I sacked and jacked, then slapped the mic. Uh, now I'm ready to mic it. See, I can't rap. Chuck D does a much better job, but that's what I think of. Oftentimes it's thought of as this glorious moment, but he's literally entering into the terror of the might of empire in Rome. He's also entering into the terror of religious violence. And that's what I want to talk about today, that a different world is possible, where not only do we not repay violence for violence, but that there is an end to violence. 
Make no mistake, the horrific death of Jesus and his subsequent resurrection was meant to be the end of violence. It was meant to be the end of the violence of the sacrificial system, the system that demanded the violence of bloodshed to atone for sins. So it was believed. The system that demanded the violence of bloodshed and carcasses be burned, creating an aroma that was understood to be pleasing to God. So it was believed. The system that demanded the violence of circumcision in order to be in covenant with the divine. So it was believed. The system that demanded the violence of stoning for certain sins. So it was believed. Jesus entered into the city on a donkey, thus juxtaposing the common image of a conquering king riding in on a horse. Horses and their riders were a frightening and horrific Image synonymous with the power of empire. Thus, donkeys were seen as a symbol of peace. That Jesus is coming to do battle with the violence of religion, the violence of empire on their terms, but not in the same manner. Jesus goes and he embodies a judgment on the violence, the bloodshed that Israel had coalesced into its understanding of Yahweh. And he embodied one of the prophecies that was made in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 11 through 12. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Later that week, Jesus embodies God's displeasure in all this bloodshed and violence when he goes into the temple courts and flips over the tables of the money changers who are selling animals who have been set apart to be torn apart, split open, and have their blood spilled. Holy Week is a week full of symbolic themes images, and moments. Consider that one of them is Jesus is taking up the mantle of Abel, who would be killed by his brother Cain, embodied by the religious leaders of the Jews. Much the same way that Cain's complaint was that God favored Abel's offering more than his own, The Pharisees and religious leaders of the Jewish community in first century Judea complained that Jesus was more favored by the people than they were. Just like Cain, they chose the way of violence and bloodshed to resolve their complaint. However, Jesus was an altogether new and better able While Abel's blood cried out from the ground, Jesus' body arose from the ground, demonstrating that death was not only unable to hold him, but that the way of violence could not defeat him. Moreover, the death and resurrection of Jesus in the manner in which he died demonstrated that ultimately the power of empire could perhaps be overcome or subverted that perhaps Jesus had shown the way to defeating the power of empire and perhaps put an end to also the violence that was so synonymous with empires and kingdom building in the ancient world. Rome had built its empire in the same fashion that so many empires before it 
in empire since have gone about the business of empire building. They deployed the sword and required those they seek to conquer, those they seek to rule, to bend the knee or fall upon the sword. The cross was another tool of violence Rome concocted to sustain what it built by showing what happened to those who resisted or posed a threat to its power. But Jesus appropriated the cross into the ultimate symbol of love and self-sacrifice, a symbol of salvation, or did he? I used to think that. I used to believe that. Now, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that it wasn't the other way around. You see, contrary to what the death and resurrection of Jesus was intended to do, has not the violence continued? And oftentimes, is it not continued in the name of Jesus? So when the preaching team of Watershed meets together, we will have these brainstorming sessions where we come with various different ideas, themes, topics that we're thinking about creating a sermon series around. It could be inspired by a book, by a quote, all of it being something that we think uh, really fits the trajectory that we are on as a community. From there, we'll go ahead and start to figure out who's going to preach when and pinpoint different sub-themes from the big idea. So when I looked at the spreadsheet and saw that one of the themes in a different world is possible was don't repay violence with violence, I said that one really resonates with me. In a similar fashion that, that last week Sean brought what really resonated with her, with her opening up liberation theology and just did a fantastic job of unpacking that for us. I'm thinking, you know, violence, repay violence for violence, the end of violence, I really like that. And I'll, I'll be honest, as I was thinking and brainstorming and tossing around the idea in my head, you know, marinating on it, I was thinking of, you know, kind of introducing it in my signature kind of humorous style where I'll harken back to something from my past, like how when I was a kid, we used to get a good beating. Like if we got in trouble, right, we knew that the violence of the belt could come and that would keep us in check. But how like I've gone ahead as an adult and understood, right, that maybe that's not the best and most effective way to raise a child that's not going to need counseling later. Not to say that I require counseling. I believe my parents did the right way, so I don't want to throw my parents out there under the bus. That's not what I'm trying to do at all. But I think you get what I'm saying. But there's always that tension with, like, that kind of punishment, right? Because, like, I'm not going to lie. There's those moments where I'm in, like, I don't know, the mall or a grocery store, and there's some kid acting up, like, just acting a fool. And I'm like, yo, that kid needs he's a little behind, like, that, you know, the end of violence, let's progress past that. That's what I was thinking before Atlanta, before Colorado. That's not to mention what is continuing to happen in Myanmar. The violence just continues in such a way that what feels more appropriate is a time for lament. A time for grieving. A time to sit with the reality of violence that's much bigger than the kind of discipline I personally experienced as a kid. Why does the violence continue? 
Why hasn't the death and resurrection of Jesus actually brought the violence and bloodshed to a grinding halt? I mean, and it's often done in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We got this guy in Atlanta who is wrestling internally with his own lusts that oftentimes his understanding of sin always requires violence to deal with it. Whether it's the tearing down of self and shame. But instead, what does he do? He directs his violence upon these women to, I mean, we don't even have time to get into the way that women are continued to be the object of violence. That in the midst of all the trying to figure out who this guy is in Colorado and, you know, then we, we hear his name and then we start saying, oh, okay, he's, he's from this place. And all the confusion or all the stuff and conversation going on around, oh, he, he's a Muslim. Like, are we not surprised in some way not to excuse what he did at all? But when we understand and know the history that is of the violence that has been done in the name of Jesus and in the name of religion, we understand that this was yet one small act, perhaps, in the over thousand-year-long violence between Christianity and Islam. When will the violence end? Jesus appropriated the cross into the ultimate symbol of love and self-sacrifice, a symbol of salvation. And in response, empire appropriated the death of Jesus, continuing the narrative that the divine requires violence and bloodshed to be appeased. The cross has often been misunderstood as necessary violence for our wrong, when in actuality, it was meant to be the end of violence. In fact, that was the early ethic and good news of the church. But unfortunately, the church coalesced with empire and violence as a way of the cross became reinstated. Christianity eventually turned back to a God of violence, even war, where violence can be justified against those who don't bend the knee, where violence can be justified on those who are deemed sinners. One only needs to look at the palpable statement of 1452 and what the church gave monarchs the permission to do in the name of Jesus in expanding the kingdom of God, expanding their empires. Seek out, destroy, have them submit even to perpetual slavery, and how much that has shaped the very world that we live in today. America, a country built upon so much violence. In his book, My Grandmother's Hands, the author talks about how in a lot of ways, the violence that we associate with, quote, whiteness, was actually just a continuation of the violence that was going on in Europe, where the people who eventually called themselves white were constantly committing violence against one another. That when they came here, it just continued. That if we really want to heal 
So many of the issues that are here in America, we actually have to go past the, quote, beginnings of white supremacy and go back to even the kind of violence that was going on in medieval Europe and address that and begin to heal from that. Perhaps it started with Constantine, but America is just the latest in the long line of empires that appropriated the cross and the man on the cross into its justification for violence and bloodshed in order to carve out its little empire. The world we currently reside in is a world that doesn't simply repay violence with violence. It preempts violence and it presumes to be impending with violence. It uses violence to establish and maintain order. It uses violence to produce goods. So how do we get back on track towards an end of violence? I've got three thoughts or ideas to consider. One, the power of empire wants us to use its power, its tools against it. That way, if we actually manage to defeat an empire, we don't actually defeat it. We just take its place. We see this in the Hunger Games. President Snow is temporarily replaced by President Al McCoy. That one is just as evil as the other. One is just as likely to use violence and bloodshed as the other. We see this in Star Wars. I know. <laughs> that the emperor is constantly tempting Luke to basically take on the same violence that he has spread throughout the galaxy and take up his father's place by his side. The ring of power, I got you, David, doesn't want you to destroy it. It wants you to put it on and wield its power. The power of empire wants us to use its power, its tools against it. That way, if we actually manage to defeat empire, we don't actually defeat it. We just take its place. Second, we need to recognize and wrestle with the tension, the thin line between the desire to protect the innocent and vulnerable and to fight fire with fire. Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yo, we give Peter a hard time oftentimes if you've grown up in evangelical Christianity like I have. But Peter in the Garden, right, we, we jump straight to or I was always thinking we, to jump straight to how G, uh, Peter like, basically rejected Jesus three times, denied Jesus three times, forgetting that right before then, bro was ready to throw hands. Not to mention the fact that he had a knife in one of them hands and sliced off a dude's ear. Like, yo, Peter was not playing. But Peter was doing it in order to protect and defend the one who he deemed and who was innocent. And if I'm not honest, there's a part of me too that I have no taste for violence. But if it comes to protecting those I love, those who are innocent, those who are vulnerable, I might be ready to throw hands too. And therein lies the tension. Jesus tells Peter, those who live by the sword die by the sword. And I've always thought of that as if I take up the sword of violence and strike someone else down, then inevitably I will die in the same manner. But could it also mean that if I live by the sword then the sword never leaves my side until the day I die. 
It is always with me. I am constantly living in fear, much like Cain was, of who's going to come for me. Third, the divine points us towards a future where we take the tools and machines of war and refashion and repurpose them into, into tools for creating and cultivating good. There is many references in Scripture to this idea, this picture of swords being turned into <laughs> tools for creation, swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Two weeks ago, was the 25th anniversary of the school shooting in Dunblane, Scotland, where 16 children, kindergarten age children, and their teacher were killed by a gunman. Another 15 people were injured. It happened March 13th, 1996. By November of 1997, through a grassroots movement, Scotland was able to have an almost complete gun ban to where guns are now only kept at uh, um, gun clubs, where gun enthusiasts have this huge plot of land where they can go out and hunt and do all those kind of sportsman recreation activities. I've got to admit that I'm personally pessimistic about whether or not we can actually do something similar in the U.S. I look at what happened at Sandy Hook, and I'm like, we missed our chance. Now, I oftentimes feel that any kind of conversation around gun rights is pretty much pointless because that ship sailed when we looked at what happened to our young school children and said, nope. But perhaps, instead of a conversation around gun rights, what if in reclaiming the true nature of the death and resurrection of Jesus and the world that is possible because Christ lives and we can have union with the Christ, the conversation instead is about how we turn handguns into water hose heads and rifles into power washers. whatever that conversation is around gun violence or any other kind of violence that continues to be perpetuated. The end of violence starts with me. It starts with you. Do we really want to live in such a way that we allow for the violence that has been done to us for us to be healed but for us to not take up the way of violence, the way of bloodshed, and really live in such a way that the death and resurrection of Jesus really is the end of violence. In closing, I just want to read Isaiah 2, 1 through 5 as a prayer and as a hope. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, 
neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen.